Welcome everybody to this webinar on Silent Night and the Regulator's New Powers. I'm delighted to have with us Stephen Skills, who is one of the main experts on the matter. We worked together on it for a number of years. Also, Mark Bowie, who's one of the leading restructuring partners at Mazars. Andrew and Helen, you see the pictures here, they, they worked on the matter with me too. And it was a sort of a broad uh, team at Burgess Salmon at one point. I think there were some 15 of us working on the matter. As DJ said, there are, there's the opportunity to ask questions. We will try to answer questions at the end. If there are some that aren't, just please do contact Jacqueline. There's a link, I think, on the system. We're happy to answer questions as of the Massage team. So the way we're going to structure it is there won't be that many slides. Uh, we want to make it more discursive. Helen's going to introduce some background to the new act. Then I'll be very briefly talking about the case. Uh, important is, of course, an important point is that the case was settled with the pensions regulator and therefore there were no findings. And so anything we're saying is really sort of generic in respect of uh, our thinking. There were, there, nothing is to be, uh, nothing we say is to be taken as uh, anything in respect to a finding, of course. And one of the slides that I bring up, that's actually verbatim from the pensions regulators section 89 report. There's also a free triage tool that we hope is useful. That's going to be right at the end of the session where employers, trustees, advisors are able to sort of click through and triage, you know, if this happens, what might be the, the result? What might be the regulator's powers that, that could be used? What steps could I take if the regulator were to consider using its powers? Again, that is available uh, by request and Jacqueline and our team has a link for you there. So with that, I'll pass over to Helen, and thank you very much, Helen, for everything you've done on the case and, uh, and for providing this summary. Thank you, Clive. Um, great case to work on, particularly so early on in my career. Um, so before we turn back to Silent Night, I just want to give a high-level summary of the new powers of the Pension Schemes Act 2021, which could well have derived in part from Silent Night. And this will be familiar territory for all of the attendees, I'm sure, but we just wanted to give a quick recap before we go into set the scene for the rest of today's webinar. So firstly, the Act introduces two new additional grounds for contribution notices. These are up on the slide, so these can be issued against a scheme employer or anyone connected or associated with one. So the first is the employer insolvency test. This is where, because of an act or failure to act at the relevant time, there was a material reduction to the debt recoverable from a scheme employer on a hypothetical insolvency. And there is a statutory defence to this. Now, the second new test is the employer resources test, where if the act or failure to act materially reduced the value of the employer's resources relative to its estimated Section 75 debt to the scheme, if the scheme were wound up. Now, the statutory defence to this test is where a person gave due consideration to the extent to which their act or failure to act might reduce the value of the employer's resources relative to the amount of the estimated Section 75 debt. And if the person considered that this might occur, the person must have taken all reasonable steps to eliminate or minimise the potential for the act or failure to have that effect. Now, to use this statute of defence, the person would also have to prove that it was reasonable for them to conclude that the act or failure to act would not bring about a reduction in the value of the employer's resources relative to the debt. Precisely on the contribution notices, as with the existing grounds, the regulator must conclude that it's reasonable to issue a contribution notice. So a lot remains to be seen with these new grounds, but essentially they make it easier for the regulator to use the powers it already has. And just in terms of how trustees can respond to this, we believe that good governance and an audit trail will be key. So it's really crucial for the statutory defences to evidence that advanced consideration had been given. The trustees can look to keep good records of communication with the regulator and the employer. Now we move on to the next slide. The criminal offence is the most talked about aspect of the Pension Schemes Act, and there are three of these. So the first is of avoiding an employer debt. This offence is committed by a person who, by their act or conduct or failure to act, prevents a Section 75 debt from becoming due, or reduces the amount that becomes due, prevents the recovery of some or all of the debt, or compromises the debt. And for this to be a criminal offence, the person must have intended their actions would have such an effect. Now, the second criminal offence on the slide is conduct risking accrued scheme benefits. So this would be committed where a person's act or failure to act 
have a material detrimental effect on the likelihood of accrued benefits being received. And again, the person must have known or ought to have known that their actions would have this detrimental effect. Now, the last criminal offence on the slide is failure to comply with a contribution notice. So a much more simple criminal offence and intended to really reinforce the regulator's power to issue these contribution notices. The criminal offences on the slide are due to come into force on the 1st of October of this year. And it's worth bearing in mind that anyone can be liable. So this could be lenders, investors, advisors, and even trustees. But in practice, these offences are largely intended to have a deterrent effect. And there is a reasonable excuse defence. So these actions will only be capable of being criminal offences if the person taking them did not have a reasonable excuse. It will be interesting to see how this plays out with advisors in the future. Now, if we turn to my final slide, the Act also introduces new civil penalties, meaning that the regulator will be able to impose penalties of up to £1 million for all of the offences listed on the slide. And there will also be fixed and escalating fines for non-compliance with information requests. So it's just worth noting that avoidance of employer debt, conduct risking accrued scheme benefits, and failure to comply with a contribution notice are both civil and criminal offences. And the fines for the criminal offences under the Act is unlimited. But we just wanted to say that the fact that it's unclear if or when the regulator will use criminal offences or civil penalties could create a problem in respect of the regulator's information gathering powers, particularly an interview. Everyone will be aware that civil and criminal sanctions have completely different legal privileges, and a person, we believe, should know which one is likely to be pursued when they're invited to interview. And there could be a conflict between the duty to comply and the right to not self-incriminate. Now it's back to Claire to discuss how this all fits in with the Silent Night case. Fantastic. Thank you, Hannah, for that. So just turning to the next slide, as I say, this is essentially verbatim from the Section 89 report from the regulator. And headline summary in the, in the purple box, the regulator set out that the Silent Night Group DB scheme was, was severed from the employer's business by pre back administration. One of the aspects of the case was that the debt was acquired by HIG in January 2011, and then the next month, February 2011, an on-demand facility was entered into. Then there was the insolvency, and the regulator's case was that the targets acquired the bank debt and used their position as a lender to bring about the unnecessary insolvency of the employers. One of the points which I think is really important coming from this case, not just on the facts of this case, but for the calculation of the amount that contribution notice can be awarded for in the future, um, is reflected in the, in the wording below. I'm not going to go through all of that wording, but in, in essence, a, a, an initial warning notice was issued for £17.2 million. Pounds. Uh, the deficit was £96.4 million. Pounds. And the reason for the difference was that the the deficit in the warning notice one case or in warning notice one was was calculated by reference to the bonus decision a few years before and in the bonus decision which is about jacquard weaving and the, and the amount that could be obtained for the sale of those weaving machines the the decision was that actually the contribution notice should be for the difference between what was obtained for the assets and the insolvency compared to what the panel and the court believe should be attained, should have been attained for an insolvency that was run on an open and transparent basis. And so actually a relatively small amount of money was ordered to be um, paid in the, in the bonus decision. When we uh, received the uh, warning notice one case, and as you'll see, uh, the trustees replied, and that's, that's ourselves working together with the experts and the trustees replying, our view was that if it's always the case that the contribution notice amounts are by reference to insolvency, then it will be very rare that you would ever have a, a full amount of a buyout uh, quantity amount awarded, you know, because it's very rare that in an insolvency, by definition, there's, there's sufficient assets to pay all of the parties. It's nearly the definition of insolvency that there are insufficient assets. And so if that was the case, if you were to acquire as a business a pension scheme, I'm now talking generically, I'm not talking about Silent Night, if you to acquire a pension scheme, you could say, well, I have a, say, a £96 million deficit, a £100 million deficit. I've been told that the insolvency return on an open basis is £20 million. 
that means I can actually have an 80 million pound arbitrage, place the company into insolvency and, and pay that 20 rather than the 100. We submitted that that can't be right as a matter of policy and that where a company can exist going forward and where there is uh, not an imminent insolvency risk, there should be the higher amount awarded. And as a result, uh, it said at the bottom, we concluded that the trustee's arguments had merit and that it was appropriate to issue a second warning notice for £96.4 million. Pounds. And so therefore that move from the original bonus level of calculating damages or calculating the amount of a contribution notice to that higher level, I think, is, is one of the fundamental points. That's why the experts are absolutely vital in this case, because the experts were there to show that there was a future for the business in the view of the trustees. Again, this matter was settled and there was uh, sufficient cash flow. And for that, we, we turned to Stephen, who was an expert in the, in the field. And with that, Stephen, I just uh, wondered what you think about it. But before I'm going to turn to that, I, I just also think it's important to think about the FRC position. So there was a decision by the, by the FRC in respect of KPMG and the insolvency petitioner. And with that, DJ, we're on to just the next slide. Now, Andy, who worked with me on the insolvency aspects, is going to talk some more about the FRC matter later and some of the principles out of it. But as people may know, the, the fine in that matter was the second largest ever. There was a 13 million pound fine and the insolvency petitioner was not able to act for, for 13 years from the point of the decision. And points, and again, this is verbatim from that case, and these is actually for these findings, this wasn't a settlement, was that the, in the view of the FRC tribunal, they, they were troubled by a failure to be able to act in solely in the client's interests, and that there was an interest that the insolvency petitioner's firm had in potential future work from, uh, from the group. That impacted the objectivity of the advice that was provided. And also there was a point in respect to dialogue with the regulator and the PPF, you'll see lower down in that quote. Uh, and actually that's referred to further in, in the FRC judgment as well, or in, the, in their press release, that one of the factors that gave rise to a higher fine that might not otherwise have been the case was that uh, they believed that there could have been greater transparency when working with the pensions regulator and with the PPF. That's everything from me in respect to sort of a whistle-stop tour in, in relate, relating to the FRC judgment and also uh, the Section 89 report. I'll pass over to Stephen now. Stephen, what do you think were some of the key principles from your perspective in the Simon Mike case? Yeah, thanks, Clive. Um, I think there's four key takeaways um, from the case that, uh, that certainly from our perspective. And the first of these is solvency and what that actually means. Um, it's not really quite as simple as just saying a company's going to run out of cash at a point in time. What's absolutely vital in analysing the solvency of a company that's got issues, whether it be debt or pension liabilities, is looking at its cash flow um, uh, profile, its working capital profile, and looking to see whether that can be uh, managed and um, what the sensitivities are that drive it. It's clearly very, very important for the management to get, give you proper cash flow analysis and to understand the basis on which it's been prepared. Often you will find different cash flows are prepared for different purposes. So you need to get to the heart of what is the maintainable, realistic and sensible um, cash flow. You also need to look at um, what is the funding position of the company and um, solvency and working out whether um, what's in place is sufficient or whether there are actually alternative funding mechanisms that might be available in the market that would alleviate any, any flow issues at a point in time. Assuming that you get sort of comfortable on solvency, i.e. there's not an immediate um, problem, um, the next takeaway is valuation of the company itself, valuation of the assets. I know most people on the call will understand the difference between enterprise value and equity value, one being the, the enterprise value being the value for all stakeholders and then equity value being the value for the, the actual shareholders. But, but it's, it's, it's really very, very important because underneath a company with issues, there's probably a, a, a very profitable company waiting to get at. If you can get a company that's solvent and can trade normally and therefore 
generate a positive net cash flow and profit, you have something that has value. And then having got value, you need to understand the, the waterfall of who is entitled to their share of the enterprise value, who has the first call on it, whether it be uh, secured debt, um, debt providers, whether it be the uh, pension scheme, or indeed the, the various shareholders. But understanding fundamentally where your obligations lie on that and where that value needs to be allocated is its key. And just the final valuation issue, um, making sure that you have an up-to-date uh, valuation of the uh, of the defined benefit pension scheme so that if there's any deficit in there you don't get any surprises and you know fully what those obligations are. The third area, and as Clive's already referred to, is conflicts of interest and objectivity. And you know, from an advisory perspective it's clearly impossible and very dangerous to try and act for both sides um, in action, especially one where you've got a lot of conflicting uh, interests um, at play here do need to understand the position of all stakeholders and you cannot ignore the regulators in this uh, in this, this circumstance here because effectively they, they will have a say as to what you do with the value. And absolutely you cannot be um, uh, making your judgments um, as an advisor based on any future fees or any other business that you might expect to get from uh, other parties involved in the transaction. It clearly is to the, your clients and your interests alone. But the last takeaway is, is what's been referred to as the burning platform um, in various of the uh, public um, documents on this and by that it's effectively um, it's a situation where you are standing on, on a platform and it's burning underneath you there's nothing you can do and, and the key takeaway for me on this one is you've got to be very careful not to engineer that burning platform in the first place or facilitate a problem that you actually bear to solve. And, and if you think about it, um, if you are if you manage to deal with the solvency point, help with the valuation of the assets and you're comfortable there is real value there and you're acting in the best interest of your client, it could be that a longer term solution might protect value for everyone better than a hasty knee jerk solution. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you, Stephen. Um, Andy, from your perspective, in working with the IP community, what do you think the repercussions will be for, for advisors generally? Yeah, thanks, Clive. Um, I mean, in terms of repercussions, I mean, the short answer to your question is, perhaps unsurprisingly, there will be you know more scrutiny and more regulation. And I think there are sort of three sort of takeaways from from you know they've come out of Silent Night. I think the first point, and we heard Helen at the start reference the new legislation that's coming into effect um, you know that's clearly been influenced to, to some extent by what happened in silent night and in particular the new criminal and civil civil penalties which apply to any person put advisors with within the the remit of, of the regulators powers now um, the second point again I think uh, reference is the FRC decision you know that clearly has an impact for for advisors particularly IPS and I'll come on to that in, in, a, in a bit more just shortly and then I think the the, the the third point to my mind is sort of this concept sort of general sentiment in the market. And I'm sure some people on the call today will have seen this week the APPG on their business banking report, which um, which referenced the Silent Night case and is uh, you know asking for greater regulation in 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 this area. Now you know, now is not the time to debate the merits of, of that report, but I think as a general concept, you know, these these issues are, are out there and, and that inevitably drives behaviour on, on all sides. Um, coming back to uh, just perhaps just to clarify a point, in terms of the, the new the new legislation, then for insolvency practitioners, there is a statutory carve out in relation to some of the new um, uh, sanctions. And that applies for insolvency practitioners who are you know, appointed and acting within their functions as an insolvency practitioner. So it, it's noteworthy, but I guess that, you know, what is equally noteworthy is what that won't cover is obviously pre-insolvency advice or, or general restructuring advice that IPs uh, tend, tend to do a lot of. And, you know, and that's understandable. If you look at Silent Night, clearly the act of the insolvency practitioner, the administrator in that case, and transferring the business to HRG was the final final part of a much, much bigger transaction um, and, a, and a great deal of planning in, in relation to that. Um, 
coming back to just the FRC position um, and one of the you know one of the takeaways, uh, uh, there is some overlap here between the, the FRC position and, and, and again the new pension schemes act, and in particular the um, the, the, the reference to the, the reasonable excuse defence, which um, which Helen referenced earlier. So if you look at the TPR draft guidance. What that says is that in most instances, any professional person who is acting in accordance with their professional duties, their their conduct, and, and other obligations ref, referable to their you know particular um, professional services, they are likely to have a reasonable excuse. I mean, it says you know carefully worded, likely to have, um, but I think in that respect, you know, there are some parallels, and and, and therefore it's important. I think that that advisors understand. Um, you know what it was that the FRC was 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 looking at in in, in terms of of Silent Night and and the, the sanctions and orders that they give, and as and as Clive said earlier, I mean the the, the key things for the FRC were um, you know conduct that breached objectivity and integrity, and, and conflicts was was a big part of that, and they identified that the, the fact that the um, the relevant individuals didn't act solely in, in the client's interest and indeed there was conduct that was deemed to be contrary to the client's interest and they also identified you know that dishonest uh, interaction and dealings with the ppf and the reg regulator so you know uh, a, a big emphasis on, on on transparency in terms of how you draw all that together what are, you know what are the takeaways well Inevitably, with the new legislation, FRC decision, that you know the direction of travel here means that advisors need to be a lot more wary, and they need to be on top of this. Um, transparency and conflict seem to be the you know one of the key key issues that that then where there needs to be focus, and importantly, there needs to be internal procedures within within organisations to, to 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 back that up. And I think. With the sort of the knock-on effect of that, it will also be, to my mind, there will be greater emphasis or consideration of, you know, for advisors in, in terms of their engagement terms, how information is presented, reliance, and, and, and as Helen alluded to earlier, you know, are, are there ways to structure engagements where advisors can take the uh, more control of how information is disclosed and, and, and the protection of legal privilege? Thanks, Andy. I suppose that raises the issue of practical steps. You know, there, there are the principles. What does it mean for the community? I mean, Mark, I know that you work extensively in in the in the pensions field with trustees. What do you think are the practical steps that the pensions community needs to take into account? Thanks, Clive. Um, so, as as Helen's highlighted, the the act's been designed to to broaden regulators' powers. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to revisit that here, you know, because the aim is to capture rogue behaviour that's undermining the scheme or weakens the covenant. But to do this, it's been necessary to cast the net wide, not only in terms of those covered by the Act, but the types of events and actions that are likely to impact the scheme. And I think this means there's now going to be greater need for employers to consult with trustees, consider the impact of the scheme on a much wider range of activities from M&A, intergroup lending and perhaps material shareholder dividends. But to me, importantly, the failure to act or do nothing now carries equal weight, which is putting greater need to think about areas where trustees' dialogue may not have been previously sought. And you, to an extent, I think stakeholders need to begin to self-regulate and think about the implications of, of, of what this scheme means for how they're acting each day. But to be able to do this, we need to get an understanding of the duties and roles, think about the moving legal framework. There's nothing different there. But commercially, we now need to think about what bad looks like. And I think that's why the lessons of the Sun and Light case that you're sharing today are, are so relevant and important, especially for us as practitioners advising our clients. I think one of the key practical changes is the regulator will have a much greater reach with the ability to rapidly access information and interview key people. So it's been said before, and I can't say this enough in my mind, it's about documenting meetings, decisions, taking independent advice and keeping those records safe. I think that's that's more important now than ever. And for trustees, I think this is going to mean they're going to be you need to be armed with a richer and more detailed information set, be given a much clearer and, and firmer seat at the ballroom table as a, as a key stakeholder, and look to take close counsel from their trusted but independent advisors. And it's been said before, you know, 
the Simon Knight case really brings out how conflict management should be a key priority of all parties. You know, when we get involved in large and complex situations, it's not uncommon for there to be multiple stakeholders, each with their own advisors. And I think by mapping out these relationships, trustees can satisfy themselves that there's true independence. And Stephen touched on it, but it goes down to considering the financial strength of the employer and where business value breaks in the balance sheet and stakeholder structure. So by identifying who's going to gain or lose in the, in the event of the transaction they're being asked to consider, we can then consider whether the advice people are taking and their conduct behaviour is independent and appropriate. And to me, this is where trustees need to be brave, and maybe call out any concerns they have, uh, and put it on the, sh the shoulders of the advisors and stakeholders to make it clear how they're managing their risks and to make sure these conflicts uh, are adequately mitigated. So in short, um, a lot to digest and some words of caution, but I think for those operating with transparency and independence, we can continue to, to move forward with confidence. Thanks, Mark. I suppose that comes back also to the question of, of covenant, of valuation, of cash flow. Stephen, turning back to you on that, I mean, it was, it was a central part of the case. Uh, you know, the valuation of the business, the ability for it to survive, I believe that will be, even with the new powers, I think that would still be a key point when you're looking at, is there a moral hazard risk? The, the question we have is, well, what are the prospects of the business? Because that, that is a factor when considering the relative powers and also the degree to which they may, they may be used. Um, from your perspective, when stakeholders are involved, what, and let's say there's a restructuring, what do you think the key issues on valuation uh, should be that, that there are that they should be taken into account. Yeah, thanks, Scott. And I mean, as Mark just said, the the absolute fundamental point here is where is the value break in the um, structure? Uh, who is entitled to their share of of the value above it? And the key, if we go to the sort of some detail points here, if we start off with uh, cash flow and profitability, uh, as I said before, it's absolutely vital to understand what the business can generate in terms of cash. And you absolutely need to look at the forecasts that have been prepared, why they've been prepared, who's done it, and, um, and whether you uh, have got the right sensitivity analysis around it. You also need to look at um, where there are issues, because obviously the, the, in this particular circumstance, and more generally in the restructuring case, there will be a cash crunch coming. And, and the question there is, is it, is it a timing issue? Um, or is there actually a downward trajectory of those those cash flows? And have you got within there all the, re the realistic costs of the, of the transaction or any structuring? Uh, have you got a management team that's doing everything that's possible to prevent unwelcome surprises reappearing? And is it credible? And again, as people on the school know, you do need to understand the difference between profit and cash. And the working capital cycle is vital. And in a retail business in particular, where um, have to manufacture things and then sell them and to be quite clear um, how that work cycle works, what headroom you've got within the facilities and what other facilities are there for you. And, and lastly, you just need to think about um, why is there a cash cash problem or, or has that cash problem been masked by one-off seats and um, have been sort of balance sheet um, items that have sort of masked the issue? And, and has the working capital cycle actually been manipulated the, the wrong way to um, to, to cause a problem or, or indeed to hide a problem. So we sorted out um, cash and profitability as, as, as the key part of working out whether there's actually value trading business, you then need to turn to the balance sheet. And, and on the balance sheet, I mean, fairly self-evidently, there's, there's all sorts of things on there that you need to be wary of. Uh, first up, you need to be making sure that the liabilities that are on there are, are, are the real a real realistic view of what um, is what they, what they are. You also need to just see if there are any hidden assets on the properties of, of par. Is there, is there anything else on there that um, to be aware of? Is goodwill actually um, a, 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 a value value? Does it have any value here? And you know, it, 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 it's a difficult one because brand is associated with the profitable, successful companies, and if you've got a problem, that erodes brand value, but it doesn't mean to say that there is no value in the brand of, of, that, of that business. So I think overall, 
in, in terms of um, a transaction and when you're letting the if it be advisors and stakeholders decide um, what's the best uh, action for the, that particular company, you have to have a real understanding of the true underlying value of the business on a trading level and perhaps on an asset level. Um, Clive, I've, I've got a question for you actually. Um, we obviously worked for quite a while on the, on the case. Um, given the new regulations in place, do you think Silent Night would have happened if it was the if it was under the new regime? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, working on it so long, it you think about the the future of, of regulation a lot, actually. And I suppose I'll go up a level, so I'll talk about the general principles again and a silent night type case. And I've broken that into three areas. Would would the conduct have been the same if the powers were enforced at the time, the new powers? Would would there be changes to audit? And would the outcome have been different with the new powers? I suppose on conduct, of course, one vital aspect it will be uh, how the regulator will act going forward with these powers. And I genuinely believe that over the years to come, the regulator will want to establish, and understandably, because it wants to be able to regulate the community, that the powers can be used and will be used in the, in the advisory world as well as against employers. Uh, I think that is one of the major extensions, and I think that lawyers, accountants, actuaries will be subject to to review. And linked to that, I think that is one reason why there may be a difference in conduct because of those powers. It may be that advisors working with private equity, banks, employers may may be taking a slightly different approach to. Uh, risk appetite, realizing that you know there is, there is that risk that, that places that, that, that fall square on them as well. Also, the new notified events regime uh, and the extension to it, uh, I think, means that you know there's going to be that earlier um, connection, that earlier dialogue with trustees, and I think those are probably the three areas of changes to conduct that will be the main ones. As regards audit. Uh, from working, I don't know, from 15 years since the act started doing uh, moral hazard work, the, the audit, I think, on you know, the all of the cases I've seen has been absolutely critical. You can have cases which are very similar in nature, but the, the different way in which stakeholders are um, taken into account, the way that that is recorded, the way that uh, people are consulted is, is, I think, quite often a determining factor. And I think that's going to grow even more going forward because, again, the, the advisors may be thinking, I have to think about the file for my own purposes. Now, normally, for example, the case of the issue of privilege is, is one owned by the client. If there is a request that's made by the regulator or a formal request made, made by the regulator for the provision of information, sometimes protected items or, or privilege status will be, will be key to the question of disclosure. And that will be one for the client to say, well, I waive my privilege on this matter. But there may be times where the, the advisor said, well, I, I think actually because I have liability here, privilege should be, and that, because of that liability, that privilege should be an issue which is relevant to myself as well. And so it may be that advisors will be seeking advice during the course of restructuring and have the duty of privilege owed to them as well. So the structure of the advisory relationship with the clients, I think, is going to be a, a very important issue going forward. A second one is about client confidentiality. If you're working and advising trustees or employers, quite often there'll be client confidentiality principles either in the contract or as part of your professional duties. And again, if you as an advisor are receiving, and this is both for advisors from a contractual perspective, but also from the employer or trustees perspective when looking at the contracts with their advisors, you might be thinking, if I am subject to a regulatory request, I may want to actually share papers with the regulator. I may want to be able to show that the ABC defence has been fully considered and applies, but then I contact my client and they they may for, they may have different advice, they, there may be different nuances or there may be different interests, and they don't want to actually share the, the papers with the regulator and then they enforce the confidentiality provisions of the contract. So I think that, that those provisions are also key. So privilege, uh, how is that going to change going forward, and also uh, confidentiality, how is that going to change? Lastly, and, I, and just one question from Mark, and we'll come to the triage tool, 
I think a, a critical thing will be how the new powers are used. So the ones that Helen talked about, about uh, the asset impact, the insolvency impact, they are uh, new tools. They're broader than the old material detriment, main purpose test, the contribution notice. A question which you know I think will be an interesting one is what will be the quantum, what will be the amount of the contribution notice in practice use there? We, we spoke earlier on about the the change from 17.2 to 96.4 million based on full buyout on the material detriment test. And, you know, will there be still cases that are right up at the buyout amount on a change to the insolvency basis contribution notice? Or will the quantum be what that delta in the insolvency, what that change in the insolvency return was in the view of the regulator? Again, we would we would submit that there, there should be the high for, from a trustee perspective, the higher amount. There will of course be corporate submissions and maybe even when we act for corporates, understand it also submissions the other way. So I think the amount that it should be ordered in a contribution notice will be another key point. But that's everything for me on that. I'm just going to have one question for Mark, which is about COVID and the impact of it for for, for schemes, particularly DB schemes. And then we'll do the triage tool. And if there are any questions, we'd be delighted to deal with them. Mark, over to you on, on COVID and its impact. Yeah, well, thanks, Clive. Um, but, I mean, companies going to thrive on or suffer at the hands of the, the economic and legal environment they operate in. And, it, you know, it's fair to say that COVID has been a pretty large bump in the road and created huge change and uncertainty for many businesses. But for others, it's been a hugely uh, positive boost to their trade. And our role as advisors is to typically help our clients understand and then navigate the commercial implications and changes in this environment. But of course, we also need to think about new legislation, such as the Pension Scheme Act. So it's combining that the legal framework with the wider commercial and economic uh, context to tailor our advice. So I think with this in mind, it's going to be increasingly important for trustees to stay much closer to the key commercial drivers and risks of the scheme employer, including how the company was and importantly continues to be impacted by COVID. So when considering these commercial drivers, look, financial performance is always the key starting point. And you know, without sounding like a broken record, you know, receiving regular and timely management accounts with, with a rich narrative on the key issues has to be the cornerstone for any stakeholder. When I'm considering financial forecasts in our covenant work, which are always going to typically underpin a deficit recovery plan or will be one of the factors of employee strength. The accuracy of, of historic budgeting is going to help stakeholders form a view on how much reliance can be placed on future numbers. And th this is look, especially relevant given the impact of COVID. It's one of the key challenges we face with the clients we've been working with. It's been so difficult to forecast. So businesses that have forecasted well and can form a good view on the trading outlook and have got a good track record, you can put a much greater reliance on their numbers. I think it's also important to get a good understanding of the capital structure. We've talked a lot about that today, but it's more about how it's moved over the past 18 months. Some companies will have built quite big cash reserves, so perhaps these can be used to repay deficits rather than fund big dividends back to shareholders. Alternatively, employers may take on large seagulls loans maybe stretch creditors or have large amounts due to HMRC debt. So I think it's just understanding how that how that balance sheet's moved over the past 18 months. And then thinking about the strategy of the company. Now, if this is all clearly articulated, it's going to signpost any areas where greater engagement with the trustees might be needed. So one area could be, you know, um, a company going on a, an aggressive acquisition campaign to cherry pick uh, businesses that haven't fared quite as well. And we've definitely seen an increase in M&A activity um, where shareholders are seeking early retirement because um, they've seen value reducing their business and they just don't fancy climbing back up the hill again. So we've definitely seen COVID increasing the desire for shareholders to, to exit businesses early. And linked to this, the people factor is the board and how they responded to the crisis and generally engaged with trustees. You know, we often get asked to evaluate management, which, which is a really difficult area, but you, you get a feel for the quality of the board from your dealings and interaction with them, how transparent they are on things and whether they provide information on a timely and proactive basis. And I think I think my final point is to look beyond the company and get a clear line of sight of how the market and sector in which the, the, uh, the company works in 
um, has been impacted and how they expect that, that sector to respond and recover. And this extends to the supply chain and customers, you know, whether there's any real risks around that, such as exposure to a particular sector or a company that's high profile failure. But what's clear to me, though, Clive, I think, is the, the pandemic and other external pressures such as Brexit are continuing to have a real impact on businesses and the wider economy still. Yeah, one of the questions we get asked so often is, well, you, you're a restructuring professional, you must be, must be really busy. Well, look, we, we are, but, but insolvency volumes are, are very low. And this is, you know, it's been well rehearsed, but support measures the government have been introducing around funding, have really prevented the, these insolvency floodgates from opening. But I try not to finish on a too gloomy note as a restructuring professional, but we are expecting an increase in volumes. And I think my guidance would be that stakeholders need to be mindful of this when considering the financial health, not only of their, their scheme employer, but the wider environment in which that company operates in. Um, and so to keep an eye on how the, the recovery goes post COVID. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark. Yeah, I'm really grateful for everybody uh, and for their insights. Um, and I know that people are very happy to answer questions. We've got one question that relates to GC valuation. I've had feedback on the chat from Stephen that that's, that's a question he'd like to answer in, you know, in a more in-depth in basis. So we'll, we'll, I'm sure we can take that uh, you know, on afterwards, but probably not one that can be dealt with just, just as a quick question, but a, a fantastic question on GC valuation. If you just turn back to the slides, DJ, we're just going to go through the triage tool now. Uh, in respect of that tool, what we've had is people saying, you know, there is a lot to consider here and we now have overlapping powers and employers and trustees have said, we, we can't really keep asking ourselves the questions from a legal perspective because the, the law is complex. So material detriment, insolvency, you know, that, that always needs advice. But is there a tool where we can say, I'm I'm lending, you know, I'm I'm borrowing more money, what's the position? I'm the there's a change to what I'm doing to my factory, what's the position? And whilst this isn't legal advice, it's a free tool. There are it's interactive. So behind the tool there are sort of 80 pages and you click through when you come to different options. So it's a bit like one of those. I'm showing my age now, but a bit like one of those books you, where you decide to turn left or turn right and then you go to the particular page, but here the link page to the page. And so just to give it, a, a, and if people would like this, it is freely available on request. And as I say, Jacqueline has the link. And DJ, if we come to the next slide. So what you can do is there are various ways that you can access it. There are homepage documents. Uh, and there are, so there are different sort of tools to get in and that, and that will then go to different links. So this is a, this is a screenshot rather than a live version, but the live version is available. And you can, what you can do is, for example, say, okay, there's a business event. I'd like to click on the business event, what would happen? That would take you to the next slide, DJ. And then you have a choice. So you could say, okay, uh, something's happening. And what we're doing here is reflecting the primary parts of the statute. You could say something's happening to the assets. You could say uh, something's happening to in respect of security. In respect to profitability or alternatively this tool can help take you through the powers and the defenses and practical steps so you, you've got two options there either by way of of what's happening or you have a specific question what's it what's a cn what what's the defense what's clearance if we took a click on one of the business events that would take you to the next page and then you can look down the side and think what's the impact and then the right hand side will show you the likely, again, not formal legal advice, but the likely potential powers that would be engaged under the Act. So if, for example, an Act is designed to impact the debt owed to the scheme, that's something under the definitions that could be subject to a contribution notice, could be the criminal penalty, could be the civil fine, whereas some of the other powers you'll see uh, are engaged uh, in different circumstances. So there are some events so material detriment is more for contribution notice or for example resources is more contribution notice in some circumstances but more fsd financial support direction and others then if you you can click on any of those pink links to take you through so then if you just click on the link it would take you to the next slide and here the link we have is the one on avoiding recovery of the debt and that will then tell you what the the definitions are you can click through to the definitions of connected or associated persons 
you can also go through to uh, the potential defenses and mitigation. And again, if you were to click on one of the links, that would take you to the next slide. And then it, there is the description of clearance. So that's essentially everything on the on the PSA tool. Depending upon what you want to ask, it will take you through to different screens. So that's everything in respect to the tool. But no other questions that I have, unless uh, and I'm mindful that everybody's time is you know is important. Uh, you know, every minute we can spare. Unless there are questions, maybe from Stephen or Mark or Andy or, or Helen. I'd just like to again say thank you so much to both Stephen and Mark for joining the Bridge Seven team today. It's been, you know, we're really grateful for it. We're really grateful for the insights. Really grateful for your input over the matter. Uh, thank you to Andy and Helen as well. And I'll pass back over to DJ for uh, you know final comments and and closing closing the webinar today.